Awesome. All right, so before we get started with the next panel, I uh, wanted to make a special presentation. I'm going to invite Sam Caligioni up here from Dogfish Head. He's going to help me with this. So thanks to you guys out there, we were able to raise a significant amount of money for the Tennessee Craft Brewers Guild tonight. So this round of applause that you're going to give yourselves is for you. I didn't need to say that. It's for them. Um, but we just wanted to say a very special thank you from me and Sam. Thank you guys for coming out tonight and supporting the Tennessee Craft Brewers Guild. And I think Anthony's here. To, is I Anthony around? To, oh, know, nice. There he is. Say a couple words about the, your, your, uh, your guild and the work you guys are doing. And thank you so, guys for the hospitality. So with your help, we were able to raise over $7,000 tonight, guys. Thank you. Now, yeah, share a couple words about the guild. Uh, just real quick, I just want to say thank you so much to Dogfish and all the sponsors tonight. Uh, we're really trying to build up our guild here in Tennessee. Uh, we're one of a uh, few states that don't have an executive director yet, so we're trying to raise money, keep building up our guild. So this really helps us a lot as we continue to grow. And uh, we'll, we'll be there soon with an executive director. And the BA has been so supportive of us. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. That's all thanks to you guys. So thank you. Over $7,000 for the Guild. Round of applause. All right. And without further ado, I'll just jump right in and invite all our panelists up right here. I think you guys all know Sam from Dogfish. He needs no introduction. We also have Dave Duffy from Brooklyn Brewery. Big round of applause. Charles Slezak from Lowe's Foods. And, D and, Dave, Will and Dave Williams from, uh, from Bump Williams Consulting Group. If he looks a little familiar, that's because he is Bump's son. He is the next generation of the Bump Williams Consulting Group. And I think we got you first, maybe. I don't know. Did we have you first? My first. So, yeah, so I'm glad to be here, and thank you for having me. We are launching Dave into the world. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're here to talk to these folks today a little bit about how the category is maturing, uh, focused mostly on the retail segment. And I think, I think everybody knows that it's getting tough, it's getting competitive, it's getting complex. And most of the discussions that we're having at Brewbound with our sources or friends in the industry or folks like Sam and Dave, um, is really more focused on you know, what's going to happen in the future, what's coming next. Uh, now that all the major beer companies have their craft brands, how are they going to use them? What happens if the growth within craft continues to slow, or God forbid, there is no growth in craft? Um, these are questions that everybody continues to ask us, continues to ask each other, and so we found it necessary to talk about it. Um, it's safe to say that there's no shortage of questions keeping everyone in the industry across all three tiers up at night. So these folks are going to tell us what keeps them up at night, what they're worried about, what they're paying attention to, and we're going to be able to tap into all of their brilliant insight over the next 45 minutes. Um, before we get rolling, how many of uh, you guys went to the general session today and were there? Okay, great. Um, so. I wanted to address one of the comments that Eric Wallace had uh, from Left Hand, and he had made this comment, um, and I think that just the tone of the general session this morning in general was really about uh, sort of the dividing line between big beer and independent beer and supporting independent breweries and continuing to adopt the seal. I mean, that was the big takeaway for us. And Eric had said that acquired brands are weapons in the arsenal of the big breweries and used to control as much of the market as possible. And I'd like to get everyone's reaction to that right off the bat. So I will start with the person closest to me, Dave Duffy. Sorry, Dave. That's completely uncool. This was not in our pre-read. I'm dropping the mic. Uncool. Did you guys hear that ABBA's getting back together? Can we talk about that? Um, uh, okay, so... There's no question that they have a lot of market power. There's, there's absolutely no question of that. And, we, and, and I think that it's, it's alarming and it's a little bit scary. 
Um, and for sure, at the chain level and, and at retail level, they have a lot of power. I still think that at the end of the day, it's about brands. And if we're doing a good job and doing things better as much as we possibly can, I think that, that that's the path. This is a crazy time right now. The, 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 in the industry life cycle, we're sort of at that, that top curve, and it's moving. It feels like it's sort of peaking a little bit. And this is the time in any CPG industry where you have to think about, about having good brands. And I think if we just do that, we can weather any storms as regards market power from, from, uh, from organizations that are much larger than us. Sam, what was your reaction to some of the comments yeah. today? Oh, well said. Unfo uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, attend, but I uh, heard good things about all, all the presentations at the uh, general uh, uh, remarks this morning. You know, I, I, I would say, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm a uh, past chairman of the Brewers Association's board, so I'm probably a little bit uh, biased on, on this point. Uh, but I, I do uh, very much b believe in, in uh, the, the independent shield and the, the initiative, but not in terms of who's a good person and who's a bad person. But it, it, I, I do think there's a lack of transparency um, that uh, consumers really deserve to know who makes the brands that they, uh, they're, they're, they're buying. And oftentimes the brands that they're perceiving as if they came from small independent breweries, I think they deserve to know. And then if they don't give a shit once they know that and they want to buy a beer just based on they like the label or they like the flavor or they like whatever, um, at least knowing you know wh where the, the money of that brand, where, where it's going, where it's coming from, I think consumers deserve to know that. So I, I do support the shield. Charles, you have a, probably a unique perspective being a retailer. Do you feel that some of these larger corporately held craft brands are being used as weapons in the, ars in the arsenal of big breweries and used to control the market as much as possible? Or are you pushing back against well, them? Well, I, I got to push back on that a little bit. I think arsenal is uh, a little aggressive. I don't know, am I alone? Am I alone here, arsenal? I don't know. I, it's a little aggressive. I, I may be alone. That's all right. Hey, I, our I, first brewbound fist fight. No, I like it. I like. It. That's why I'm up here, right? Okay, fine, fair enough. Arsenal. So for me, uh, for me, when I uh, when I talk to my guests and I look at my guests' purchasing patterns, uh, for me, it's about conversion, right? So uh, converting out of the big domestic packs and the, uh, the boring beers that are out there and trying something a little fun. So, uh, you know, if they can do it, that's uh, that helps us all, I think. Interesting. Uh, Dave, you talk to a lot of brewers, big and small. Um, do you get the sense that there's concern about the future of quote unquote crafty brands and what they might do to the marketplace and how they might disrupt things? Well, I think when you look at the geographic locations where some of the acquired breweries exist, some of the styles that those brewers excel in, and you combine that with the sales force that the mega brewers have available to them, the relationships that they have in place with distributors, I can certainly see why it could be perceived as a threat. And I think the flexibility they have in a lot of areas that independent craft brewers don't, I mean, it'd be hard to say that it's not a potential threat down the road. And I think that is the view, and I think it has, has some water to that, yeah. Yeah, and one of the ways that we've seen at least some brewers try to combat that threat is by, I guess, getting into their business and playing on their turf a little bit with some lighter lagers, some more sessionable offerings, larger pack sizes, uh, 80 cent cans of domestic premium lager, uh, which made some headlines earlier this year. Um, you know, we've seen mid-sized breweries test out light beers for $6.99 a four, or a four pack. Um, I think it was, it was Night Shift's new nightlight beer. I went to their launch party a couple weeks ago and they had, you know, hundreds of people waving glow sticks around and live music all drinking light beer. And I thought, man, like I, I would have never predicted this when we started this whole brewbound thing back in 2010. I would have never thought that I'd be at a light beer launch party for a mid-sized craft brewery cranking out maybe 30,000 barrels and everyone's waving glow sticks around. Um, is <laughs> did you guys ever envision that craft beer would be like this in 2018? I, I, short answer, no, at least not this quickly. I mean, 
any industry as it gets bigger and it tries to attract more drinkers, you're going to start trying different things. You know, that's just inherent in trying to grow your business. I think it's happened a bit more rapidly in the last year, year and a half, two years than you one might have expected. I think the, the pro to that is if it's getting people to start trying craft, drinking craft, you know, converting from other segments, other categories. So I think there is some silver lining to that. Um, you know, the image of craft has evolved. It's going to continue to evolve. Um, I think it's just a bit of a shock in, in terms of how fast it's happened. Yeah, and, and Charles, you've seen some of that conversion in your store, have you not? I have, so uh, for me, uh, I'm able to look at cart data and source of volume, and you know, I keep a close eye on these 15 packs, the uh, Founders All Day, look at Dayblazer, Solid Gold, all, you know, all of those. And uh, interestingly to me is uh, the number one item that my guests are, uh, are leaving to go into these 15 packs um, sorry, Rick, uh, but it's a uh, it's Miller Light 24 pack. So number seven on the list is Bud Light suitcase, and um, uh, so it's you know if it's converting some people, maybe it's doing the right thing. Yeah, and and we've heard the folks from Founders, Mike specifically, talking about kind of punching through the ceiling and you know introducing some of these uh, different options for craft beer consumers and really trying to mainstream the category. Sam, I think you have a little different point of view on that. Um, you, you <laughs> I know you have a different point of view on that, so let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and kudos to any brewery that finds a successful model to navigate this competitive moment. There's tons of uh, un unique uh, models as valid as ours. It, it is my opinion, though, that uh, you know, the, the, the um, prevalence of, of a buck a beer craft beer model, a $15.15 pack model, runs a very serious risk of, of commodifying and homogenizing uh, craft. And, uh, you know, I, I get that there's a flavor bridge and the majority of beer drinkers still live on uh, light lager terra firma and any step off of that flavor bridge to, you know, an approachable, you know, white beer maybe made by a big brewery, marketed as a, as a craft brewery or, or, or otherwise, could hopefully lead to people, you know, venturing further onto that flavor bridge. But I, off, I do also wonder, can we, uh, can we really uh, qualify how, how many times the $15, 15 pack buyer is actually coming from the other side of that flavor bridge uh, was drinking local independent beers uh, and came back towards that $15.15 15 pack that, frankly, I, I think uh, economies of scale-wise, only uh, you know a handful of international conglomerates can sustain that kind of pricing and still be able to reinvest in their brand, their people, and their community. So I worry about that. Yeah. Dave, you guys at Brooklyn haven't gotten into the 15-pack game, but at 21st Amendment, you guys have just started dabbling in it. What's that experience been like? It's new to Brooklyn. We, we uh, with our new platform with the three breweries, uh, the 15-pack the that 21A does is a new thing. So forgive me, uh, my, we're, we're learning, we're learning as, as we go on what we're seeing with this thing. There's no question that it has absolutely been relevant and there's no question that the consumer finds it to be a value. And they define value lots of different ways. They define value in convenience and quality and brand and price. Um, they're defining it uh, as a value. Uh, in the case of 21A, uh, what they did was, and it's, it's a $17.99 target, it's not discounted to distributors. Uh, and when they brought it out, their target was $17.99, $18.99, and then they were able to take their six pack pricing upward. Uh, so as far as price erosion goes, together, um, I, I feel less like there's price erosion there, but I, I share the concern that everybody has over the long haul. But, but we've, thus far, we've seen that the consumer has, has voted and said that they like the value, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's good to hear that uh, we, are, we have a tool that we can, it, it's about margin pool. Uh, it really is about margin pool, and we have to have opportunities and, and create opportunities to, to increase our share of the margin pool. I, I look at it a little bit like, um, I use the analogy of a football team. If you're a football team and, you got, and, and you're and you playing against a much bigger and better football team and you have no wide receivers, and, and they do. Um, I feel like this gives us an opportunity and some tools to level the playing field a little bit and, um, and be able to fight, fight the good fight and try to gain share. Does, does the pack size essentially just mean that brewers are giving away three free beers 
And, and what do you risk when you do that? Sam, you, you guys have a little different approach on how you wanted to go with multi-packs and add value. So maybe talk a little bit about why you didn't take that road. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, uh, we don't, I wish someone would invent a machine that would mix like beers into one 12 pack. If someone's in the room is uh, super smart and can figure that shit out, uh, that would be great. But it's a laborious uh, hand project, you know, for any scale brewery to do these mix packs. But the consumer has definitely spoken. Regardless of price points, they love that uh, variety. Uh, we've, we, we first did it about 15 years ago. We did a mixed uh, 12 pack in a generic brown box that we. Uh, we, we, we shut with uh, duct tape that just had a, it had a UPC code in the duct tape and it had uh, 60, 90, and 120 minute. It came out in like 2007 or 8, 2008, 2009. And it came with a, one of those paddle balls with, with a, uh, and it said, play this game and drink this beer until the recession's over. And it was 40 something dollars, a 12 pack, because it came with uh, 120 minute as, as part of the mix. So uh, those days are behind us, unfortunately. Um, but we do, we, 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 we still believe in the multi-pack, but we kind of feel like this could be a good opportunity to have a soapbox of, of a 12-pack that we can stand on and say, you know, not every multi-pack has to be $15 a 15K. So ours is, uh, has, uh, we're coming out this summer with a mixed pack that has uh, three each of, of four of our, our, our most popular canned beers. It also has a koozie in every 12-pack, and the 12-pack origami is up into a, a cooler, a functional cooler. So we're trying to say, hey, look at all this value that we're adding. Come with us on this journey to a $21 uh, 12 pack instead of uh, the $15 50 pack. <coughs> That's. <laughs> yeah. It's, an, it's, an, it's a noble quest. It seems like it's going to be a, a tough road to is hoe. Is it a soapbox or is it a shield? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Have you put the seal on your label yet? Bob Pease was asking. Yes. There you go. Um, Dave, I wanted to get your thoughts. I mean, I, you have tremendous insight into the data behind this. So I asked the question, you know, are brewers just giving away three beers for free? What do they risk when they venture into this territory? Um, essentially, you're trying to compete on an unfamiliar turf. And, you know, I think the comment was made that uh, a lot of these companies venturing into that space uh, run the risk of being under-resourced and not being able to fight the fight long-term. What do you see in the data? Well, I mean, it's hard to deny that 15-pack cans are growing. Uh, if I look at the IRI off-premise numbers, they're you know, one of the fastest-growing pack sizes. That being said, with recent press of other big brewers expressing their interest in expanding their 15-pack portfolio or even alternate pack sizes, I, I mean, you're inviting that competition head on and that's a battle you're going to lose you know 10 times out of 10 as a small independent craft brewer so you know in terms of just fighting them head on it's it's just going against kind of what craft has been and was and just the image of craft in general i mean especially when you think about the fact that you know craft beer beer in general is losing households uh trips to the store are down so when you're looking at trying to grow craft the only alternative left is increasing that basket ring. And when you're charging value prices, you're not growing the basket ring, you're giving it away. Um, so it's, it's kind of you know, steering off that path that Kraft has been on, and it's, it's gonna be a hard battle to fight and, and win. But at the same time, and I'll, I'll kick this one to Charles, at the same time, beer in general is losing share to wine and spirits. Kraft has been the growth engine for a few years to kind of help offset some of that. Um, but there is a real concern from a lot of folks in the industry that feel like unless we solve the volume issue, uh, it, it's, it's going to be real bad real quick. Charles, what's your thought? That's a good point. I tell you what, and uh, a point we didn't talk about a little bit earlier is uh, when I look at the 15 packs, con you know, continuing on that, uh, the frequency of purchase for us is uh, not any less than a 12 pack. So it's... Oh, it's, uh, they're getting out there on a weekend. They're buying a 15-pack to get them through uh, the weekend, and the frequency of purchase is there. So it's, uh, maybe they're just finding other occasions, I suppose, during the week. So it's, uh, it's filling a niche. It's filling a niche for sure. And I think that the 15-pack uh, the uh, buyer is different even than the, uh, well, certainly different than the four or six-pack. Uh, I'm, I'll buy your 21.99, 12 packs all day long. 
Verbal <laughs> contract, guys. Verbal contract. <laughs> I'm there. Witness, I'll witness. do it all day long. I'll do it all day long. Ron, you following up on that? You're in the room somewhere. <laughs> See, but it, it's a different person. It's a different consumer, and uh, so I think there's room. Yeah. Well, you don't want to commodify, Sam, you don't want to commodify craft, but there is this volume issue um, that at some point, I think the industry as a whole is, is really going to have to face. Um, I'm curious, you know, how you feel about, as, as someone who owns and operates a distillery as well, um, how you feel about the continued loss of market share to wine and spirits and you know what the beer industry needs to do collectively to address that. First, thanks for reminding everyone I own a little distillery too. That's helpful for whatever I say next. Uh, <laughs> but I will say we love We're all about facts, not all <laughs> facts here. We do, we do love our distilling business. It's a small part of our business. Dogfish Head's compass, like our, our uh, why we exist, is to, to, to be uh, very good as a beer-centric company. I won't bore you with the actual verbiage, but we are a beer-centric company. We're not only just in distilling, we have restaurants, we have a beer-themed hotel, but beer is the engine of our, of our uh, company. So, you know, we, we, have, we have some concerns, you know, with, with uh, well, what was the question again? Make sure I get that after the distillery. <laughs> the distillery point, make sure I want to answer your question. Sure. So, how will the beer category as a whole continue yeah. to sort yeah, of okay. claw so, back that share from wine yeah, and yeah. spirits? Yeah, now I'm back on track. So, uh, <laughs> I gotta have uh, I'm good. Liquid Don't truth. Liquid truth. Um, Sam, remember in our promo video, we said it was liquid truth serum all the way. You're, you're proving the point right now. I forgot. So. Um, you know, I will say, you know, uh, we are a beer-centric company. We want beer in general to be healthy. And I know I, I've been a big... Uh, advocate of, of the Brewers Association's definition of indie craft, and I will I, I truly believe in that. But I also would love to see our world's biggest breweries that dominate market share in our country reverse their trends on their light lager juggernauts and compete strongly with, uh, you know, with, with liquor and spirits that's taking share from, for, or liquor and wine that's taking share from all of us, particularly on premise. I think there's a great opportunity for all beer to figure that shit out on on premise because we are losing on premise co uh, collectively. Um, that said, you know, I think a big part of why we're, we're we're losing share is retail operators, smart retail operators on and off premise, understand that if they can build their models around trading people up, they're going to be more more profitable. And frankly, beer is under indexed in terms of its focus and execution up market. Um, Dave, you and your, your dad have done some great work analyzing that. And you look at the stratification of pricing in beer and, or, or wine and spirits, and it's so much more skewed up. But the good news is trends are in the favor of the folks that are, are working to trade people up, all three tiers in, in this room and outside of it, where I think 75% of beer that's defined as craft beer by I, IRI uh, is under $40, $40 per, per case. That's only growing 1.8% year to date. And then you look at beers between $40 and $50, growing, I think, about 20, 22%. And then uh, over that, somewhere close to 30%. Um, so it's cool to see that growth trends, not, not volume right now, are bringing people up. Yeah. How much of that is tied, and I'll kick this one to, to Dave, how much of that is tied to ABV, that, that pricing? And you know, how do you solve the volume piece of it if you want to sell a forty to fifty dollar case of a five percent or God forbid, less than five percent beer at, at such a high uh, margin? I think some of those, if you're talking ABV, the significantly higher the extreme ABVs. I mean, those are on the high end of the price tiers. There's no arguing that the special releases, those those types of beers, but. A lot of that growth Sam was talking about, the 40 to 50 to 60, you know, on a case average to consumer, I, I mean, that's all, you know, regular IPAs, they, average ABVs, the ones that people drink on a daily basis, and that's up 15, 20, 20 plus percent collectively. Um, some of that is also because a lot of new entries, um, you know, are driving incremental sales to the category, but that's about a third. So most of that growth is coming from brands already in market, not extreme ABV, just you know, everyday IPA on the shelf. Um, probably a poor choice of words there. Um, 
but um, you know, just growing and, and growing organically by um, you know improving their velocity, getting more facings at, at retail, things like that. So, I think. Those brands have proven that they can grow, that price is not a deterrent to the average craft shopper. And if they can keep increasing their penetration at retail, at chains specifically, I think they, they can, they've proven they can carry a load and I think they, can, they have legs. Yeah. Uh, Duffy, I'll kick this one to you. What have you seen through the development of the sales platform between Brooklyn and 21st Amendment and Funkworks, which you know, very unique, you know, on their own, unique uh, brands that you're offering to the market at, you know, of, of varying prices. Um, what are you guys seeing that's performing really well? And how are you guys learning from one another to start applying it to, you know, something that 21st Amendment learned, put it into Brooklyn, vice versa, Funkworks selling a, you know, high price Saison, what are you guys learning from one another, and um, how are you guys evolving? That's a huge question um, <laughs> that I'm not really prepared to answer. Um, what did we learn? Well, I think we've learned a lot from our, our partners. Um, you know, 21A has really taught us about portfolio focus. They really got four core brands. In Brooklyn, we have our, our Focus 5, which I think is a contradiction in terms, right? Like Focus 5, how do you focus on five things, really? Um, so we've learned uh, from 21A and from, from Funkworks on um, really thinking about a smaller, tighter portfolio. I think that what we've all learned together is that this category has grown all these years really on brand introduction. And now we're at a place where we need to start thinking about brand development. We have to change our mindset away from rampant introduction of things after things after things. And we've, we've created this monster. We really have. I mean between one six barrels and, and that rotation nation. I mean, you know, I think we're to blame for a lot of these woes that we have for a lot of things. We really are. Um, so our focus now is to, is to dial back and for all three of us, really dial in and say, gosh, what are the two or three things that we have to do well from a brand perspective? Get away from this buckshot mentality, get to the rifle mentality, look at accounts, find the accounts that we feel like we can really build brands with. Let's have a conversation and a consulting-based discussion and say, let's build brands together. Yeah. And we can do that when we have a portfolio for the three breweries where we have Belgians and Sours from Funkworks at high at, at 11.99, 12.99, six packs, and we have 15 packs with 21A and Brooklyn Lager. We have a nice breadth. So we've learned that the width that we have, we have portfolio depth with three breweries instead of having ungodly portfolio depth with one. Yeah. Charles, how eager are you to have companies like Dogfish, like Brooklyn 21A, building brands in your stores? Yeah, that means everything. So for, uh, for us as a retailer, our guests are looking for that engagement, right? They're looking to hear the stories of uh, Brooklyn, Dogfish Head, you know, tell us how that beer was made. Uh, tell me about the hops, you know, what went into the process. And so uh, that, that's, that's critical. So you, you, know, you narrow the focus and uh, you get that laser point going and then it's, uh, it's great for everyone, especially the boots on the street are so important. Can, can you give an example of something that's really worked in your stores for all of us brewers in the room, like a POS or a program that, that's really worked? I would say uh, now I'm on the spot. So uh, <laughs> a great example is, oh, how we're, uh, as a retailer, we're unique in many ways. Uh, but we're fortunate to have an on-premise license. So uh, now you can come into one of, uh, one of my stores and hang out and have a beer and you know, shop if you want. Uh, but to the next level, what, uh, what has really worked well is uh, we'll do a beer dinner. So we'll get some items from around the store, you know, tie in a little of our branding, a little bit of your branding, and uh, we'll do the pairings in the store. And then the next time they're in the store, they'll never forget. They're like, the craziest thing just happened to me I can't believe I was in here, I was having a beer, and I did these pairings with that, and that beer over there was fantastic, so it means a lot. So creating an, an experience uh, off-premise for folks to really understand and grasp what craft beer is all about, and who, who are your consumers, Charles? Are they mostly sort of the mainstream shopper that's just getting involved in craft? Is it high-end folks that you know, are very familiar with it? Who are your shoppers? Oh, yeah. So yes, yes, and yes. 
So uh, we've been very fortunate. We've, uh, we've built up our uh, craft business over the years. We're now at 40% sales, including draft of uh, IRI to find craft. Sorry, Sam. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> so not too bad. Not yeah, too yeah. Bad. So um, that's pretty good. That's pretty strong. And, and I still yeah. see it. Thank you. <laughs> you can applaud. Yeah. Nationally. Thank you, Jenna. You're the best. Thank you, now, Chuck. She, she deserves the... Uh, yeah. So, our, thank you. Oh, Cheers. We'll share. We'll share, Chuck. Do you want to have a sip? Do you want to drink it? You can drink it. You want to drink it? I drink out of all of We're getting full over here. So, uh, back to the question, even though we're heavy craft, I mean, it's, uh, luckily, pints sell really well at our store, but, um, you know, Bud Light suitcase, that's the, uh, the number two item in the store. So Behind I, craft beer pint. That's right. I like saying that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so there's, I mean, there's plenty of work. There's, uh, it's still about conversion for me. Um, and, uh, you know, once he, I can get a guest to try a beer with some taste, then um, they're in. Yeah. They're good to go. Charles, you're on-premise, you're off-premise. One thing you aren't is own-premise. You're not a brewery opening uh, a satellite tap room or operating a satellite tap room. You're not making your own beer. Uh, and you know, we heard from JC earlier on the last panel. I mean, 95% of his beer going direct to consumer. Dave, I'll kick this question to you. I mean, how much has that phenomenon, the direct to consumer sales piece of the business, which has really emerged as one of the most robust pieces of growth, especially for the long tail of craft brewers. And, and I think Bob said it today. I mean, it is sort of ground zero, I think is what he said, um, for the, the growth of the category overall. How much has that disrupted what's happening on and off premise? And how much are you seeing from retailers um, or hearing from retailers potentially pushing back on it? I think it varies. It depends. I mean, in terms of scale and how it's disrupted things, I think the latest estimates from, from BART um, were about almost 3 million barrels um, direct to consumer from these, these breweries. So that's, it's massive. It's a massive scale. So how can it not disrupt things a little bit? Um, but, you know, when we talk to our retail partners, um, you know, they have kind of differing views on it. If they're open on hours, um, I'm sorry, if they're selling below prices um, that, that it's available on the shelf, well, then that's kind of undercutting them and they view it as a, uh, as a direct competitor. Mm. On the flip side, um, you can also view it as building the brand. So um, beer drinkers go out, they go to the tap room, they, they have a pint, enjoy it. Well, now they know what to look for next time they're shopping at the store. So th there's differing views on it. It really depends on you know, how many tap rooms does that one brewer have? Uh, is it only in their local market or have they started to expand into different markets, different states, you know, different areas? So I think in terms of how retailers view it, it probably varies based on where they're located. Um, but I think there's a lot of pros and cons to it too because it, it's very, it makes craft beer very approachable. Um, you know, some of them are even family friendly. It creates occasions. You can bring people in there and it introduces people to craft beer. But it's sucking volume out of three tier. It, it is, it is, but you know, I, you could try to put a positive spin that it's also building brands, building awareness, encouraging, you know, new drinkers to convert. So, you know, it's tough for me to say is, is an, I'm not a retailer, um, but you know, from as objective as I can be a perspective, you know, there's pros and cons to both sides of that. Dave, talking about ground zero, you're in Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn hasn't gotten too deep into that uh, area of craft. You've avoided it. Why? And what's your thought on how you move forward in the future regarding tap rooms? We're, we're watching really, really closely. I mean, this is a new, this is still pretty, pretty much a new thing. I mean, I would call it new in the, in the arc of, the, of our industry. Um, Brooklyn, um, when the Brooklyn neighborhood, I, I think that what you said, Dave, is totally right. It is absolutely situational. It depends on the city you're in. depends on, on the competitive landscape. There's a lot of dynamics, so there is no one-size-fits-all answer. But for Brooklyn, when the Brooklyn neighborhood was developing and when it was, like, not safe to hang out there, um, it was really about bringing people into the neighborhood and validating it as a place that you could go and not get shot, right? <laughs> Unless you wanted to get shot. Um, <laughs> Um, and there are people that want to get shot. Um, so we... we you, you, you don't know these people anymore. I'm no, guessing. they're all dead. Yeah. Dark web. They're all dead. It's on the dark web, guys. Um, 
So uh, at the time, we wanted to make sure that we were not competing with our competitors in the ne- or other restaurants in the neighborhood. So we have always closed at seven o'clock in Brooklyn for and since uh, literally in, since until this week, <laughs> where we've begun to renovate our tap room. And uh, now that the the neighborhood has developed. Now that there's a lot more retailers, it has been validated uh, as a really cool little location. Then a lot of the folks, that, and they're still operating, they've been operating for a long time. They're thankful for all the effort that's been done. And our sense is that you know, there will always be people that are going to take you off draft in the neighborhood. But folks are, have been pretty cool about the fact that we're going to expand our hours a little bit later. Sam, is it short-term thinking? Is it uh, long-term thinking? Are we, is there something everybody's missing when we see companies expanding with satellite locations and investing more on the retail side of own premise tap room? Or, I mean, I, I just feel like in 20 years, we're gonna look back on this and you know, kind of wonder why we didn't see it, however it ends up being. Yeah, I mean, this is like the second Shakeout moment, you know, Mariah and I have uh, lived through with our coworkers. You know, this happened in the late '90s too. There really wasn't a a, a, um, a tasting uh, room oriented brewery model in that era of a, a, a shakeout. But it's it's sort of similar dynamics. You know, f- for this moment, I'm very thankful for that model. And, f- and Dogfish Head sells about 98, 99 percent of our beer through our our. our uh, distribution partners, but we started as a brew pub, and that still is our R and D, you know, epicenter, uh, where we learn through that immediate engagement with our, con- our our customers, you know, what we're uh, evolving to bring out to national distribution, and maybe that's our own definition of what 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 we should aspire to. If we can stay in that high 90s percent through distribution, I think we're taking care of our partners in distribution uh, first, but we're still able to have that engagement with consumers that. Uh, you know, it, it, it influences our, our creative process and, and our R&D process. But I'm, I'm glad that mall exists. I'm, uh, uh, there's a ton of uh, sampling that comes along with it, a, kind of, a ton of beer education and excitement on every town level that comes with it. So I'm, I'm glad it exists. You, you were talking about starting as a brew pub. At that time, you were one of a handful of breweries that existed. And now we're, you know, 6,000 plus breweries most of which have a taproom component. And so the landscape is completely different, which I think changes how retailers view it. Um, and, you know, everybody's, everybody's numbers that we see suggest that, you know, more, more companies are getting into the space. There's, it's not stopping at 6,300. You know, we're headed towards 10,000. Um, a lot of those are gonna have tap rooms. Inevitably, they're gonna suck volume out of three tier. Uh, and are, they, are you going to suck volume out of three tier, or are they going to help beer compete more with wine and spirits? That's, and I guess that's the ultimate question. Is it creating a new occasion yeah. and a new beer drinking occasion, yeah. uh, or I'll is say, it just slicing the pie even yeah. thinner? Uh, I will say, uh, you know, I, it is an, the difference between this moment and the late 90s is I really feel like it's the consumer cares about craft, catch craft now, whereas back then we didn't know what was happening. And I'll, 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 say, that there, 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 I'll say that there's a phenomenon now that I'll call uh, smiling mouth um, jaws of death, which is, this is good, this is making us competitive, this is why we decided to be entrepreneurs, this competitive moment, but there are, I think, jaws of death, and the bottom jaw, frankly, is more of those tap room oriented breweries that can kick ass because they're in control of their their, their sales and they keep so much margin uh, by selling across the bar. So many of those business units, if they're quality consistency and well differentiated focus, are gonna weather this storm with grace and aplomb. And then there's the higher jaw of the jaws of death where you have to be a fairly scaled brewery to be uh, interested in uh, multi-state distribution. And it's going to be a lot harder to be in between those two business models than it was when we lived through what we lived through uh, in, in the last 90s. And there's always going to be awesome anomalies from, you know, the Vale in Richmond. Or I'm looking at John from Trogues. I think they're up over 100,000 barrels only selling in a, in a few states. So there's always going to be these great ones in between. But there's going to be fewer in between than there were in the late 90s, I think. 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. You, you brought up uh, the question of whether or not these tap rooms are creating new occasions. And I want to hear from each of our panelists today, uh, what occasions are, is beer missing right now? Uh, and how, how can we capitalize on those occasions as an industry? And I'll, I'll start with Dave. I mean, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I think, it, I think craft beer, the benefit is it offers so many styles. Um, I think the, the uh, challenge is just getting drinkers to understand that you know, different styles can fit different occasions where you know, drinkers currently might lean toward an import for certain occasions or might lean toward a premium for, uh, let's say, preparing for a large sporting event in a parking lot somewhere. Um, you know, I think it's just educating consumers that there are styles of craft beer that exist that can fit that to a T. It's just getting the word out, getting those brands available, um, whether it's on shelf at retail, um, you know, or in independent store, you know, anything, just to get that message out. And I think it's just educating consumers. Again, I mean, this is the mantra that we've talked about for years now, educating consumers of the versatility of craft and how it can fit those occasions that might currently now be dominated by other segments of the category. Yeah. Charles, what, what opportunities are craft brewers missing in your store? Or in your stores, I should say. Wow, so, <laughs> good question. So, as far as opportunities, there is a, uh, just like Dave was saying, there's a wide variety that's out there. A lot of the growth that, uh, I'm, or some other growth, that I'm seeing out there that maybe uh, could be hard to get into. I've seen a lot of growth from seltzers. Uh, so a lot of seltzers going on out there, a lot of growth using those as mixers. Um, alcoholic, alcoholic seltzers or not? Uh, yes, the alcohol, so the Trulies, the Spike Seltzers, Smirnoff, all those uh, have been growing really well. So well, maybe there's an opportunity. So that's a stretch. That's a little bit of a stretch for us. Uh, one of the other opportunities, probably the most um, uh, troubling for me, I, I think I might be jumping ahead in terms of things that keep me up at night, but the uh, the innovation that I've seen from the big places, the ABs and uh, Miller Coors houses, um, has been big this year. A lot of innovation, and uh, one thing that uh, we should probably take a, a little bit of a look at is uh, Bud Light Orange. It's sounding like crazy right now, so... Put that out there. You know, I'm gonna plant that seed. I, won't, I, hope I you guys won't believe can do it. Something with that, all right? I won't believe it. <laughs> I refuse to believe it, Charles. It's troubling. It's troubling. I'll just say that. So, okay, <laughs> you guys, there it is. Run. <laughs> I would challenge the group by saying that the occasions that we're missing are the ones that we haven't created yet. So what are they? Like Ooh, is that deep as shit or what? You go, you go, Duffy. All right, embrace debate, Duffy. What are they? Yeah, I have to go. <laughs> Create um, an occasion for us here today. You no, know, this is an, an incredibly creative group of people. I mean, over the last thirty years, and it's amazing what we've done. And I mean, I see events that, that are you know, with dogs that raise money for charities. And um, if we are creating compelling events, whether they be better festivals or better better fundraising activities, we can out. We can outdo the big guys by creating events and activities that are far more authentic. Sorry, compelling, but also authentic. So um, what are those? I'll leave it to the group to create those. But I think that they're out there. We just need to put our thinking caps on and make them. Yeah. So we have to create occasions, but we also have to protect them as well. Um, I think I saw the other day that like Jack Daniels was sponsoring a PGA Tour event. and. I don't know about anybody else who's golfed, but I don't really, I drink beer when I golf. Um, and that struck me as one of these uh, sort of signifiers that, hey, beer is also losing ground in some areas and it's maybe taking its eye off the prize in, in some respects. Um, what are some occasions that beer is not doing a good enough job of protecting and how can we win those back? I mean, I mean, I think right now beer is under fire in terms of um, calories, you know, carbs, things like that. I mean, a lot of the messages that you see on TV now are directly combating the fact that, you know, beer will put a gut on you. Beer will do this to you. Beer will do that. So I think it's, it's, it's not the occasions that – I think we're just losing occasions that beer already had a foothold in, and now people are starting to think like, oh, well, 
you know, health conscious, um, you know, trying to eat better, trying to live better, trying to do this, everything better. It's, I think beer's under fire right now from that angle as well, and that's, that's also troubling. Yeah. Um, we've got a few minutes left uh, before we're wrapping up here, so I, I want to shift gears slightly with a couple final questions. Um, you know, I think one of the more noteworthy uh, storylines that, that we've seen emerge over the last, I don't want to say just this year, but over the last maybe six to 12 months, um, a lot of breweries laying people off, a lot of breweries retreating from markets, uh, pulling back and focusing on local or regional models, uh, foreclosures happening, breweries going out of business, um, a, lot of, a lot of dark skies, a lot of gloomy skies out there. Um, how much of that do you guys pay attention to? And how much of the headlines do you read and start to worry about the future stability of the industry when we're hearing about breweries going out of business every week, getting sold at an auction, laying dozens of people off, hundreds of people off in some cases? Um, how do you guys wake up every day and go to work and stay positive? A feel-good question of the summer right there. <laughs> Like I said, we only had a couple questions nice left, finish. so. Who wants to go? I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll go first. Uh, and and uh, you know, I, back to my 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 the, that jaws of death, uh, you know, scare moment I gave. Uh, you know, there's going to be successful models that weather this moment. That are awesome thing is, unlike the late '90s, this moment has nothing to do with scale. There can be awesome successful breweries that have just opened up or are 20 years old that are choosing to stay local or trying to go national or multi-state. But I would say it is a moment where if your interest is becoming a brand that's in a bunch of states where you're relying on your distribution partners to sell the majority of your beers instead of your own outlets, not only do you have to come correct with being world-class and quality consistency and well-differentiated, but you have to bring the resources that your uh, distributors need uh, to stay high on their totem pole of, uh, uh, of priorities, like traditional you know, marketing and sales plans that are easy to understand and easy to execute and yet exciting to, to the consumer. And you need to invest in people. You, you know, I think you said that in Feet on the Street, and you did as well. You need to make sure there's people that are representing your brand in every market if you're not the most local brand in that market. There's someone sitting at this bar saying, why is there a dogfish handle on here? And thankfully, Caitlin's saying, motherfucker, don't touch my handle, because she's <laughs> here every day, you know? That's absolutely true. I got to follow up to that, Sam. And I can't agree more uh, for some of the folks that I've been able to uh, speak to here in the crowd. You've heard me say it. Uh, one of the most important things is uh, boots on the street. You know, get out there, tell your story. Because uh, I know my guests want to know it. They want to hear all about it. So uh, just like the general session this morning, you know, uh, go hire someone, then tell uh, the BA about it. Duffy? Bring, uh, us back. bring, it, bring us back to the positive side uh, of things. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> shit. This isn't going how I scripted it. Pass. <laughs> Pass. Uh, here's what I would say. Uh, I would echo all those comments. I, I recently interviewed a guy uh, in Denver who uh, works for a brewery, and he's not available in Summit County, Colorado, but he's sending his beer to Connecticut. And that's a recipe for disaster. And I pulled him aside after the interview was over, and I'm like, you're killing your brewery. You're killing your brewery. You're, you're hurting the entire industry. Yeah, and, and, and just and blindly sending beer across the country without proper representation. And, and, uh, we, and this, the thing that we got is personality and authenticity. And if we don't shepherd that personally everywhere we are, then, then we can expect to get diluted. I mean, we just can. Um, that said, I know that brands will deliver us. We are in a really, really crazy time right now. And this industry has been in an earlier crazy time. And back when, in the 90s, it was like, oh man, we're done. You know, 4 dollars we're done. 
and then we come, we really like Lazarus, we come back and here we are, and we have awesome brands, awesome people, we have much more scale, but we have to make sure we're focusing on A, B, and C. Worry about A, B, and C. When you find yourself worrying about D, E, and F, or like, God forbid, L, M, N, O, forget about L, M, N, O, which is fun to say, but get back to A, B, and C, because that just, let's do what we do well for the next three or five years and we'll be fine. Yeah, and I think that sort of jives with some of the comments you had shared last week about the pendulum swinging back towards uh, more approachable, more sessionable, um, you know, reliable brands that are just there always. And you're starting to see some of that in the market. How long until you think that becomes uh, the, the, the sort of normal uh, tendency of drinkers to seek out uh, you've talked a lot about brands today and just you know honing in and, and, and owning that. How long until you see drinkers start to return to that and that pendulum swing further back away from constant sampling and constant trial? Uh, and, and will that stabilize the market at that point? I'm sure Dave could probably speak to it as regards data, but I think we're seeing it now. I mean, I think we're seeing folks that have climbed the Hop Mountain or climbed the ABV Mountain. Uh, it's kind of like when I was young and I just had a bunch of weird cars, you know, I had a Saab and I had a Ford Escort, which I put a ski rack on so I could look cool, which didn't work. And it had an eight track player in it, uh, but it turns out I'm not that cool. Uh, uh, but I ended up going to this serviceable old Toyota, man, because it gets the job done. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I feel like the pendulum is shifting back to those brands that are the old favorites that, you know what, I, when I was drinking, I was drinking Brooklyn Lager years ago, and you know what, I forgot how good this is, and it's actually a really, really good, really good beer. So I, I, I suspect that the data probably proves that out a little bit. I, I can definitely talk to that. I mean, after, I mean, just looking at the, again, the IRI off-premise numbers for a brewery like Sierra Nevada, one of the brewers that brought craft to where it is today. They had a down year last year. Trends were in the red. Um, through year-to-date 18 numbers, back in the black. So they saw a lot of success with their seasonal, some of their new entries, um, one of their new variety pack entries. So some of the old guard is seeing that pendulum swing back, back towards them in, in, in their favor. So today's point, we are seeing it a little bit now. Um, and you know, let, we'll see if that trend continues. But please don't lose the innovation, right? Oh, no, you know, of course nimble, not. Stay <laughs> nimble. <laughs> Maybe just keep the innovation in the tap room. I don't know. Um, all right. Well, we've got, we've got time for maybe one more question, uh, which usually means I sneak in like two or three. Um, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it to one. Um, since we're talking about that pendulum swinging and since we're talking about innovation, uh, what is one trend that you guys are watching uh, in terms of product development? Uh, it could be hazy IPAs or rosés or whatever you want, marijuana. I don't know, we haven't touched on that yet and how that's impacting the category. Um, so what's one trend that you're watching and uh, what's maybe something cautionary you would provide uh, the remaining folks who are still with us in the audience today a watch out for the rest of the year? And we'll start with Dave and we'll go down the line. So a lot of the questions I get on a daily basis um, have a lot to do with packaging and pricing, especially lately. I mean, we've seen a shift from bottles to cans. We've seen a shift from larger pack sizes like 12 packs um, in the red in favor of the smaller pack sizes, six packs, four packs, singles. Um, and lately it seems like it's shifting back toward value packs, lower prices, 15 packs, things like that. So in terms of what I'm keeping my eye on, it's pricing and packaging um, for craft at retail. Um, that's kind of my hot button issue lately. Um, as far as something to watch out for moving forward, and you touched on it a bit with a lot of brewers that are finding themselves in some hot water now, it's, you know, be wary of rapid expansion, chasing short-term volume gains, because the demand might be there for total craft, but it's cut into a lot of pieces now, um, and it's harder and harder to build your brand the further away you move from home the relevance falls off, velocity on the shelf at retail falls off, um, rapid expansion can leave you vulnerable in your own backyard, missed opportunities, not penetrating your classes of trade as deep as you possibly can, um, out of stock scenarios, and that can get you in a lot of trouble down the road, so that would be my big watch out uh, moving forward. 
Great points. Charles? Wow, that sums up a lot. <laughs> that sums up a lot. So uh, uh, as far as outside of those great points, you know, great points, especially about the depth in, uh, within the market, uh, some th things that I've seen out there um, that have surprised me a little bit have been the uh, proliferation of uh, four-pack 16-ounce. Uh, so that, for me, somebody that draws a planogram all day long, they create nightmares for me. I know it's great for, uh, for the convenience channel, and it's, that's awesome. <laughs> it creates a nightmare for me, so that, that's, I'll just put that out there. Now, uh, 16, uh, 16, or I'm sorry, a six-pack uh, 12 ounce is great, so, but uh, a four-pack 16 ounce is a nightmare. Uh, things that keep me up at night, um, I mentioned earlier the innovation thing, and that's, uh, I really want to hit home on that. Uh, the big guys came out with some, uh, some big brands this year, so please don't lose that. Uh, don't let the pendulum swing back too far. Sam? Yeah, I guess my, uh, my trend that we're watching and my watch out like, concern are the same thing, which is don't let craft beer turn into a, a buck a bottle game. $15, 15 pack is a trend we're watching, and it's, it's a watch out for, for indie craft. I think I would dovetail off of that, and I would say that it would remind us all that we've been at a package for package, package for package price disadvantage for like the last 30 years. We really have. And then what's got us here to this wildly successful place is really, really good brands. It really has. Rah, rah. <laughs> so let's keep doing that. Don't be afraid. Just keep on building brand value. Awesome. Yeah. Let's give it up for these guys. I, I think that's a great place to end and go have a beer. We can all discuss this off stage. Uh, thank you guys for joining Brew Talks. If you like what we did here this evening, come see us in Santa Monica later this year at Brewbound Live for our two-day conference. And uh, let's have a beer. Cheers. Good job, dude. Thank you. Thank you.